Hello, and welcome back to the Bench to Boardroom podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Steele, and today's episode continues on our little foray into careers in government for people with life science PhDs. And my guest today is Dr. Carrie DeMarco, who is the Senior Program Management Director at Strategic Analysis. But Carrie has actually had an amazing career in the government. So she started as a PhD in sports psychology and kinesiology. And from there, she began working at the Army Research Institute, which then brought her in to this career as a consultant and a manager and a director and operations person within the government. Um, and as you'll listen, her career has really just taken her to places that she otherwise would never have imagined for herself. And the theme that keeps coming back with Carrie is she loves a challenge and she loves the grit and appreciates the grit that it takes to have a research career like she's had. So I had a wonderful time talking to Carrie. I think you'll enjoy listening. So here's Dr. Carrie DeMarco. Dr. Carrie DeMarco, it is such a pleasure to have you on Bench to Boardroom today. Good to see you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Of course. So, Carrie, you and I actually work for the same company, and in a lot of ways, I kind of report to you. <laughs> so there, there's our there's our little conflict of interest right here. But I genuinely appreciate you taking the time to to appear on my little podcast today and talk about your career. Sure. So, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, so um, I'm Carrie DeMarco, as you said. Um, I have a PhD, and um, that happened a while back. Uh, undergraduate, I went to a small school in Pennsylvania called Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which I generally don't tell people unless they're from the Pennsylvania area. But it's a very big school. It's just a lot of PA kids. Um, then I went to graduate school at BU for my master's and then PhD at University of Maryland. And that PhD is in kinesiology with a focus on sports psychology. That is so cool. What, what drew you to that? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny when I think back, that's always what I wanted to do. And I, it sounds crazy because like, I wasn't that kid in high school that didn't know they wanted to go to college and grad school. I always knew that and I don't know why. Like I get that question and I don't. My parents went to college late. Um, they were young high school sweethearts and sort of did everything backwards. So it wasn't really my parents pushing me. It was just sort of a drive that I had. And then my dad has always been an athlete or a coach my entire life. So I think that's where the sports psychology piece came in. I always found the psyche behind sports very interesting and like, you know, why are certain people good athletes? Other people are not good athletes. And you know, some people may not be good athletes, but they work really hard and they do really well. So that's a lot of that is how I ended up in that sports psychology area. But undergrad was uh, psychology because sports psychology was really new. Um, I graduated in 88. And so sports psychology was a really new field in the colleges and they didn't know where to put the degree. So as I was going from my bachelor's to master's, I would sort of try to figure out where do I go? How do I find this degree that I want? I know what it is, but it's not everywhere. And each school would have it in a different department. So um, depending on where you went, it would it would dictate what degree you got. It was, it was pretty interesting. So um, I had actually gotten into uh, George uh, Washington U the year before I got into Maryland, but I didn't want to get any more school loans because I paid for school. And their degree was in the counseling department. So if I had done that, instead of waiting another year, I think my career tra trajectory would have been very different. So yeah. I, you know, I would have had a counseling degree. I probably would have been able to get licensed at that point mm -hmm. and maybe gone a counseling path. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. I ended up in Maryland. It was much more of a kinesiology, sports psychology, you know, really boots on the ground kind of degree. And so there was no counseling in that piece. Yeah. 
That's really interesting. Do you think, um, so I, I, I try to work out as, as much as I can. And one of the things, and I just want to ask, um, usually what, my, one of my Peloton instructors always says like your, your mind is your strongest muscle. And if you can push past your brain telling you, you can't do this within reason, obviously I'm, I, I, I cannot push a hundred pound weight over my head. I cannot, but you know, if, if you're, if you're thinking about giving up, they'll, they'll try to motivate you by saying like, your brain is your strongest muscle. You know, you actually can do it. Do you, is that true? Do you believe that? Oh yeah, so absolutely. So um, it's, you know, it's identified as different things to, if you look in the literature, but it's often like self-efficacy, your belief in yourself, or some people call it grit. And I love that. There's my favorite um, uh, TED talk is about grit. So this, I think she's a psychologist, but she studied people her entire career. And she says, you have to go watch this TED talk. And she says, okay, I went to every background, every you know um, culture I've been to, folks with money, folks without money. She's done all of these assessments. And the one thing that got, that made people successful was their, she calls it grit. So they're, they're really their desire, their internal motivation, their self-efficacy, whatever you want to call that. But it was that factor that made people successful. It didn't matter where they came from, what their background was, money, um, you know, injuries, nothing. It had everything to do with this grit. So yes, I totally believe that concept. Wow. That's really cool because I mean, even just completing a PhD program takes so much persistence, belief in yourself especially if you're say surrounded by people who are not exactly the most positive, you know, people. And at some point we all end up completely beaten down and it's yeah. the difference between somebody who can just say, Nope, I'm just going to put my head down. I believe in what I'm doing and I'm just going to keep going. And the same thing goes with the career path too. It's everything in life. I think there were so many people that were smarter than me in graduate school. And, you know, I will always be the first to admit that, but it was about the tenacity, about about really just working at it and, you know, saying, I'm not going to take no for an answer and I'm not going to quit. This is what I yeah. want and this is what I'm going to do. So I say to anybody out there, like, if you don't think you can do it, that is not the case. Like, as long as you have that motivation and you want to grind, you can get anything done, including your PhD. I mean, I worked two jobs and pay for school, like lots of kids did, but there could be people that didn't have to work at all that didn't get through. It really just has to do with your motivation. I agree. I yeah. totally agree. Now I ask everybody this question because I, I feel like it's a good equalizer, but on those days where maybe your grit starts to falter, did you have a fantasy like, forget this, I'm done, I'm going to go do this? Like, what was your fantasy job? Yeah, I don't know if I had that fancy, but I did definitely have those breakdowns. Um, <laughs> There were moments I had, I remember very vividly, I was living with a roommate, I was getting ready for comps. So I had all these boxes of notes to study from, I mean, just crates of them. And I sat down at the table and it was a holiday weekend and my roommate was going camping and I just started crying. Like how, I don't know where to start. You have to now take all the things you've learned and you have to integrate them all as a conceptually. And I was like, Hmm, never thought of it like that. I took them each as a class. Yeah. So now I have to be able to sit down for a three day test and write all of this out and really understand the entire science behind what's happening. And so I, I really cried it out. And then, um, you know, I wasted some time and then I got back to it and just focused and got there. But, you know, I think there are those days that you wish you went a different path. I just, didn't know what that other path was. So all I knew was to just get this done. Yeah. You know, first of all, I'm, I'm amazed that your, your comps was a, a three day test. Ours was a, a mock grant, but you had to pick something that wasn't totally related to your research, you know, and you had, it was like NIH format. So you had, you know, to put it, put out a specific games page and get that approved. And then you had to put on a grant then have that oh, yeah. then an oral defense of your ideas, you know? So it's kind of like a mock defense slash mock, you know, NIH uh, or like K99. That's very smart. Yeah. 
It was smart, except I've heard of other universities who do it where it's actually supposed to be about your research. So that way, when you're done, you have a K99 that you can submit. And that's yes. much more brilliant than, you know, me trying to talk about macular degeneration when my interest was glaucoma, you know? Right. So, I mean, I, I ended up, I can still go to macular degeneration talks and kind of get what they're talking about, which is good. But, you know, um, at the end of it, all you had was a lot of paper that you just wasted a lot of time that you didn't spend doing your actual work. But man, a, a three day test, that sounds absolutely grueling. Yeah, followed by, you know, the orals after that. So yeah, but it's all a rite of passage, I think. And yeah. we all eventually get there. Agreed. And that's a good lesson to my, my mentor actually used to say that to me sometimes, like, sometimes we have bad days. That's okay. Go home, get it out of your system, yeah. whether it was a good day or a bad day, you know, you know, you, you got a paper published, good job, go home, celebrate, we get into it tomorrow. Same thing. You, you're having a really bad day. That's fine. Write it off, go home, eat ice cream, whatever you need to do, and come back tomorrow. And that's what I tell my kids too. I say, okay, you can mm -hmm. You can be depressed right now and upset, and then you're going to move on after that. So. Yep. P pity party for the next 12 hours, and then you're back on the clock. <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. That's right. So when you went into this program, what did you imagine you wanted to do with your degree? Um, I, you know, I definitely in the earlier days wanted to be a sports psychologist. So I did get a chance to work with some Olympic athletes or athletes that were trying out for the Olympics back in the day. There were two rowers from BU that I had the opportunity to work with. Um, we did some visualization and other goal setting and some techniques. I worked with uh, a national Taekwondo champion, a female champion, and really did some goal setting with her. But in reality, sports psychology is a really hard field to break into. There are a set amount of sports psychologists out there, and most major athletes have their person already. Um, and a lot come from their facility set up in the U.S., like a tennis facility down in Florida where there are sports psychologists that help run it. And so the athletes learn like who to work with at young ages and things. So it is a harder field. Let's say it wouldn't pay the bills. So it was like time to figure out how to pivot and still be interested in what I was doing and use what I had learned. Mm -hmm. with, just out of curiosity, with the Summer Olympics coming up soon, what what's your favorite? Uh, yeah, I think I really enjoy the running, like any of the running activities. I find that really exciting. Um, I also like the gymnastics a lot. Yeah. 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 Something very artistic about what they can do and how they can Just, do it. And fascinating how they use their bodies, all of the muscles in their bodies is amazing to me. I know. You know, one thing I always felt, I always feel bad for the divers because you prepare your entire life and you're, you have what, two seconds? From the time you leave the board to the time you hit the pool. Right. And that's going to make and break the rest of your life. I, I've oh, I've never envied that position. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> I don't think people realize, like, how elite Olympic athletes are. Like, there's such a funnel in athlete, athleticism. And yeah. just to get to that point, it is amazing. Right. Yeah. Anyway, no, I was, I was just curious. So then how did you end up working with the Army? instead. Yeah, so that's interesting. So I, in graduate school, lived in an apartment complex and across the hall was a, a guy that was working at Army Research Institute as what's called a consortium student. Okay. So they allowed graduate students to work there and they were very kind about how many hours, you know, flexibility, all the things you need when you're in grad school. And I said, like, I need you to get me a job there. Like, I need a job and I need a job that's in our field because I'd always been waiting tables, which is great money. But one, it's not the right experience. And two, it's like hard late at night um, yeah. when you're trying to get up and go to labs and whatever. So finally, I talked him into it and I got into ARI and was an excellent experience. Amazing researchers there, super kind, very um helped guide me a lot. Just really great mentors. I cannot say enough about um, Army Research Institute. Oh, that's wonderful. What were they interested in? What were they researching? ARI does all kinds of research and each researcher um, does different things. Mm -hmm. But I worked with researchers that were doing research on behavior, on, okay, like, let's look at the different generations and how they behave. Uh, let's, you know, like uh, attrition in the military, recruitment in the military. 
And I got very fortunate because all the stars aligned. So at the time, each as the generals move through, there's like certain units they work with. And so special forces being one of the units um, mm-hmm. down in, in um, Carolinas. Okay. So at the time, the general was very open to research, which meant that ARI could ask questions. It had to go through a research psychologist who was already at the base, but we could ask questions to the, the military guys, to the special forces trainees, etc. Wow. So that's how I got my dissertation ended up being about special forces training and assessment program and about um, psychosocial factors that do they matter when you're trying to go through a training that's significant. So I was allowed to put my dissertation questions in their first day questionnaire. So they get extensive wow. questionnaires when they're there. So to be allowed to do that was so significant. <clears throat> for me and yeah i was really lucky were they assessing like someone's mental preparedness for being part of the special forces? that's what i was kind of looking at but they are asking the, on those days they asked the soldier or the special forces um folks like all kinds of different things so there's a lot of different pieces of information they're pulling from them and some of it comes back to air eyes some of it stays with the research psychologist down there some is just for basic knowledge about each unit or group that goes through. So it's a special forces training assessment program is a usually a month long and it's a training effort where once you're selected to be in special forces, you are then have to do this training and see if you can get through. And that's before you're even allowed to train to be a special forces. Wow. Yeah. So it's pretty significant and it's very, very hard and um, clearly they do a lot of mental and physical, you know, stress activities. I was, I was just about to ask you whether you found it challenging to do that topic under the umbrella of sports psychology and kinesiology, but I, I definitely see the parallels. Yes. So that's what I saw too. So once I started working at ARI and understanding like, oh, look at these lead soldiers I'm working with. Like, they're amazing to me. They they can go out with a 50, 60, 80 pound rucksack on, walk umpteen miles. You know, they have limited food. They have to do team activities plus individual activities plus sleep outside plus go through all kinds of, you know, training. It was amazing. And I thought, this is, this is incredible compared. I mean, athletes are amazing too, but this is to me like the elite of athleticism. Next level. Yes. And what I found was, um, you know, these special forces folks are so unique in how they think and how they act. And they really have to be able to work individually as well as in a team, which is hard because you're usually one or the other generally as a person. Um, and I found that again, the motivation to complete the task was the driver. There were people that dropped out for what they would say, like they would go to get medical help and they would drop out. But there were guys that would finish with staph infections and broken bones. So if you, if you wanted to drop out, you could do that and you could get a medical waiver to like drop out, but, or, you know, not complete the effort. But um, there were guys that purposely didn't go to the medic tent because they didn't want to have to leave. So it was those folks that I found really fascinating and generally the ones who finished the program and moved on. Wow. They must have taught you a lot too about, about grit and persistence. That's amazing. Yeah, totally. I, and I knew that was coming with this group because I had been studying them for a while. I will say that they are a little bit less dependent on the psychosocial factors. So those factors were like, others need me, others rely on me. Um, you know, I'm this activity is really important to others, those sort of things. It was sort of a mix between psychology and sociology. And I was working with a sociology, um, social psychologist at the time who studied military. So that's how some of the sociology questions got in there. But what I found was these guys are really, um, they're really independent in how they operate, which is how they kind of need to be. And if I gave the same test to basic training trainees, the results would likely, I never did it, but likely be very different. Because now you're talking about really young, you know, they're not sure what their future is. They join for a variety of reasons and they really need that 
support to get through. But these sure. guys, this is a whole different crowd. So oh. yeah, super interesting. That is. <laughs> and so I'm assuming th yeah. this is what, what, what set you on your path in a, in a, in a government. Yeah, uh, I immediately love working with the military. It, okay. just, it just clicked. Yep. That's so cool. So then um, I guess, where, where did you go from AMI? Where did you go after that? Um, so after ERI, I worked there for several years, but as graduate school was completing, I didn't have health insurance. So I was like, okay, Carrie, you need a real job now. Like you, so another ARI um, student I worked with, she had just gotten a job at a consulting firm. So she brought me over and that's how I got into government consulting for the first time. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that's so cool. And then, um, I guess as I looked at your career over time, I'm noticing, you know, you, you start with just this genuine interest in sports psychology, athlete, uh, soldier, special forces psychology. And then over time, you've, you've really shifted to these uh, operations roles. And uh, I don't want to say necessarily administrative roles, but you, you, you switch to a lot of strategic Mm -hmm. type roles. What, what was that like? And I mean, that's not something that people normally, when they start out a PhD program, they think this is what they're going to do. You right. know, did you find those, did you find a learning all that to be a challenge? I did, but um, I really always enjoyed challenges and it was sort of fluid in how it happened. So okay. um, <clears throat> after that consulting job, I ended up, there were some things I did in between. I did go in to try to do uh, working at a university, but that didn't work out. For a variety of reasons but then i went back and i was working for sa strategic analysis um this is in the early 2000s and i supported darpa and so that work i did for about seven years and it was amazing and i worked in a program called peak soldier performance where again the sports psychology was totally relevant it was all about soldiers far forward how can we help them physically mentally mentally emotionally you know really be at their peak Right. So we were looking at all kinds of factors like cortisol and, you know, uh, um, all kinds of um, nutrients, everything. So <clears throat> for me, that was an absolutely really fun experience. And then I, that's when I started to shift after that. I moved over to another agency that was more into chem bio defense and making sure the appropriate um, technologies got out to the war fighters. So I became, a, first I worked in um, the future technologies for that. So that wasn't a far stretch, right? Cause I had been doing like, you know, technologies of that. And I always stayed in that s &T environment, really the science and technology development. But I then became a liaison between agencies. So I found that that was something I was pretty good at. Um, the general kind of called me out and said, hey, I want you to go liaise with this other agency we work with. And the two agencies work together to make sure the products are produced and pushed out to the warfighter. So um, it was a really great job and I learned a lot and I, and I was able to try to help between the two agencies as best I could really, you know, because they do have to share money. They share all kinds of resources. There's a limited time. So these agencies, you know, they all have their struggle. And so it's like, how do you make them you work together as best as possible and making sure we get as much as we can out to the warfighter at the end of the day. So that became my next challenge and it was, it was a great job. So this and just kind of moved from there. This is, so this is absolutely fascinating because I, I personally did not realize how much research goes in yes. to the military, you know, and, and besides something like um, traumatic brain injury, for example. So <laughs> my, my, uh, the lab where I did my, dissertation and ended up doing my postdoc as well was part of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Yes. And certainly everything that we submitted, all the research and the grants and everything that we submitted had to do, had to be related to a veteran specific problem. Now, I got lucky because in many ways, most of the veterans that were being seen at that VA were older men and you know, so diseases of aging and like mm -hmm. diabetes and glaucoma and all those were directly relevant. But I, you know, I remember um, when all of a sudden there was a huge influx of money for spinal cord injury and mm -hmm. then traumatic brain injury and all these other um, uh, like and different like con concussive uh, injuries. I, I did not realize though how much is devoted to just health and well-being and stamina and 
all of this that goes into not just treating a soldier when they're down, but keeping them at peak performance. Yeah. That's fascinating. And the government is, at, you know, the military, they, they put more and more resources into that, that preparatory, preventative sort of mm -hmm. space over the years as well. So it's really, it's very exciting. I, I read a book, um, and I'm blanking on the name right now, but one of the things that they talked about, maybe you could speak to this, because my question is, what, um, what did they, did, when did they start putting an emphasis on researching the male fighters from the female fighters? Right. That, what, yeah. Being, I don't even think that was just military. I think a lot of that push came from the regular mainstream because we were finding that certain treatments and, um, you know, different therapies were not working the same for men as women and same children to adults. So, and then you're finding diversity between different cultures. So now it's, now it's definitely in the forefront, as you know, um, which is great. And a lot of, it recently came up during COVID work because, mm -hmm. as you know, there were different cultures that didn't want to, you know, trust the drug, the treatment, or they were scared or, you know, how do you get it to rural areas? So there were all these discussions about it. And then everyone, you know, people respond differently to different medications. So this became a very big topic, topic especially during COVID. And so now in some of the requests for proposals, um, the agencies, some of the agencies are writing in, like, we want to make sure you, you have to show us you have a diverse population and, you know, you're not just testing males or whatever, but the military standards tend to be males, 18 to maybe 50. Um, and they really are trying to broaden that now because although that's a good chunk of who is in the military, there are of course uh, women and others. So yeah, and and it translates as you said to outside yes. the military as well. And so um, last week I was uh, doing a lot of hiking through um, Bryce and Zion National Parks with my husband. And so yeah, every day we we have our backpacks and our you know our water bottles and snacks and everything. And I noticed we, we did a, a really long hike um, in Bryce Canyon on the on the very first day as one does. And um, I noticed afterwards, I, my, 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 my literal shoulder blades and like my trapezius muscle between my shoulder blades and even I felt like um, underneath my shoulder blades, the, the whole area was incredibly sore. And I mean, a lot of other muscles were too, but that was a little surprising to me because I didn't feel like my pack weighed that much. And I was thinking back to this book that I still can't remember the name of, but they talked about how, uh, I think it was military research where they realized that female soldiers actually were much more comfortable carrying their packs around their waist because that's where our, the bulk of our muscle mass is, you know, our, our, our butt and our thighs really versus in men, they have more upper body strength. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, geez, I wonder if anyone's created these like hydration packs that you can carry around your waist, almost like a really bulky fanny pack, I suppose, you know, to to optimize female versus male. And so that that's why I was just wondering how how research like that comes about, you know, and how they uh, w whether it's been translated directly to. Uh, yeah, I think it, it does come. I think a lot of it comes through trial and error, feedback mm -hmm. from the soldiers, injuries yeah. that they see, you sure. know, um, like Big Dog was a program at DARPA <clears throat> many years ago and, and similar programs still exist. But it was about um, robotic dogs carrying the, the rucksack and other supplies, because mm -hmm. as you see, like as the soldiers continually carry these large rucks, one, they have to throw a lot out because you can't carry it all. So they only take the basics that they need. And then two, you know, over time, you're really hurting people's backs, spines, knees, et cetera. So um, yep. really trying to figure out how to make alternate technologies to assist. I don't know if I want a robotic dog yet. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> yeah, you have to watch the videos. They're, they're, they've done a lot with them now. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. So, um, and I don't remember the... So everything in the government is an acronym, and I appreciate you defining the acronyms as you say them because everything comes out as in, in abbreviation form. But uh, I do have, to, I, I'm very curious about your time at, uh, was it JPO CBD? Mm -hmm. uh, what does that stand for again? 
Joint Program Executive Office for Chem Biodefense. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry, like the term Chem Biodefense sounds incredibly intimidating. So <laughs> right. I, as you're doing that job, I mean, I don't, what was that like? It was really interesting because um, at JPO, there are different, what they call JPMs, uh, Joint Program Managers, and those managers manage different portfolios at JPO. And um, one would maybe be um, like the medical, they change the name of the office a little bit every, you know, once in a while, but, and then you have um, sort of somebody that manages chem. So each one, they would bring in these different military officers and they would rotate out after a few years, but they had such knowledge and experience in those fields. And then under them sat the scientists, the test and evaluation folks, the program managers, and, and they really just each worked on different things. I mean, everything is somewhat related, but you have all your uh, MCMs, medical countermeasures you have to deal with, right? So you have vaccines and therapeutics and all the equipment that goes with that. So, um, you you know, they want to also, they've been really moving towards futures. So they're really trying to think far forward as well as other agencies. So future technologies in that space. And then you have everything down to PPE. So that's the personal protective gear that all these warfighters wear. How do you make it more comfortable? How do you make it safer? Can you make gear that detects, you know, things? So it's it's very interesting. There's a lot of technology in all this space and it starts at one agency and sort of moves to another as it transitions. And then it has to be pushed out to the warfighter. But not only that, a big chunk of what JPO does is maintenance. So once hmm. things are moved out to the warfighter, they have to maintain the stockpile and maintain the technology and, you know, do disposal when it's time. So there's there's a lot there. Um, it's very interesting. Were you still interested in the psychology at this point or were you interested in like you like you're talking about the actual equipment and how this how this is? Yes. Whenever something came up. Like when the TBI, Traumatic Brain, Brain Injury Center of Excellence came up, I was like, whoa, I need to go there. You know, I would get very excited about certain things happening in the military. Um, but I did really like what I was working on. And I did um, a lot with the medical, you know, the, the different medical teams. So it wasn't psychology, but somehow it fit still in that medicine, sports medicine space to me in my head. Um, really working on the medical countermeasure piece. So I found that really interesting. That's really neat. Yeah. But there's psychology behind everything too, right? So if you create something and people don't use it, then that has no utility. Or, you know, um, will will the warfighter be willing to change the uniform they wear after wearing a certain, you know, uniform for years? There's a comfort level. There's a, There's all kinds of things. So it always sort of fit in somewhere, but yeah. That's actually a really good point. And um, I've had that conversation in a previous episode where we've talked about the importance of not just it, 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 say somebody is researching something in a lab, you know, they're, they're in their preclinical stage, you know, the, you have to think about not only um, efficacy, but you have to think about the patient experience. And that's, I, I find that so interesting because you're absolutely right. We can create this thing, but is a soldier going to take the time to actually do it? And right. is this something that's going that has to be stored at minus twenty until it's used, or or can you take this in your rucksack to the middle of Afghanistan and use it there? You right. know, and, yeah. and how long does it take, and how is it disposed? And I mean, I, I I think keeping that in mind is so important for anyone who's thinking about a new diagnostic test or a new therapeutic. There was a product, you know, I don't know how much I can say, but there was a product we worked on at DARPA for mm -hmm. the warfighter. And, um, you know, there was something about it. They were like, I will not take that. Yeah. Um, it wasn't dangerous. It was just, it was just psychologically what their perception of it was. So yeah. it was very interesting. So huh. you can make it ruggedized. You can make, hey, you put this on your rock or put it on, you know, in your pocket and this is going to be great. And they're like, nope. And same with like some of the nutraceuticals and antioxidants and different things as you're trying to move them into their, you know, into what they eat and their emeries. And they're like, mm. the one time a group told me, I just see lickies and chewies. And I was like, um, okay, what is that? And that, you know, it was basically anything like, um, like beef jerky and like 
any sucking candy. And I was like, okay, like, you know, so there's a lot that they do for survival that we're not aware of that we need to understand. And, and that speaks to a much larger uh, conversation that I've had, um, I think, multiple times on this podcast is the importance of stakeholders and the importance of actually talking to the people who will use it and then having these advisory boards that represent the users, right. you know, and, and, and certainly I, I've, I've talked about this in the past, you know, you, you go to conferences, or maybe you've seen this too, and it's always the same, no offense to anybody, but it's always the same old white guys at the podium, at the table, lending very similar opinions every time. And you just can't help but wonder, like, wh where is your representation here? Who else are you talking to? Because there's no way that these people on stage are going to represent the rural population mm -hmm. or the one or the soldiers in the field that are actually using this or the patients who have to give this to a, a loved one or an ailing parent, you know, that that is absolutely critical as you're designing anything and you're thinking about, again, a, a new therapeutic or a new diagnostic or anything. Agree. And like at DARPA, they were really good about bringing in um, war fighters when we could. Um, we bring in special forces guys to look at things and give us their thoughts. We would have them come to our meetings and we would have some of them give like a briefing so that people really understood it, what it was they had to do during the day and what their challenges were. But I do think on the civilian side, I don't know that I've seen as much of that and it would be great to do that. And I do think we're more aware, again, COVID, you know, from my perspective, really brought that home and came, made everything come to a head as far as diversity. And so I do think we will hopefully see more of that and just really getting people involved. Do you think it's because of, like you said, uh, different cultures not necessarily wanting the vaccine or depending on who you were talking to or listening to, whether or not you wanted to wear a mask? Like, is, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, a lot of that. And I think COVID was really hard for everybody because it was hard to get the message out and make that message clear because it wasn't clear. It it was that old analogy of flying the plane while you're building it, right? So mm -hmm. nobody was really certain what COVID was. We were learning it as we go. We were trying to respond as quickly as possible. So the message was changing, which was, you know, giving people that a little less hope more concern and so i think the different pieces started to flush out of that and then you did have your rural communities and you had the issue with that vaccine is it did have to be stored at majorly cold yeah. temperatures and even certain doctor's office couldn't maintain those temperatures so how is a rural community going to do that um, so a lot of that did come up so this is all absolutely fascinating and uh, and when I was talking to Kristen Herring, I brought this up too, and I would love to get your input on this. So at this time, when you're you're working in you know the JPO CPD office, you had already had an experience working at the Army, and you were a government consultant, and so you were kind of already in this world. But for people who are listening, how do they find these kinds of jobs? Because as I talked about with Kristen, you, know, you can go to USA.gov or USAjobs.gov. Right. Thank you. At USAjobs.gov. And, and it, it's hard to navigate. If you I don't, don't think know. I can get a job on USAjobs.gov. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard. You, you don't know the acronyms. You don't know, like, what is a GS level? What, how right. much are you doing? You know, right. it's, it's so complicated. And, and as Kristen said, too, you know, she responded to, uh, it was called chemist. And turns out she ended up working at the White House, but they try to keep it vague on purpose. So how how can a person who is listening to this thing, you know, that sounds really neat. I would love to experience that job or apply for something like that. How, how can they learn more about right. what they're getting themselves into and get a foot in the door? I really think... Um networking, meeting people, going through people that do it. Like I am always willing to help people when I can, because I know how hard it is to get started. And you know, it's, it's important to help young people get started. Totally. But to me, the networking, the working with others that know the pathway of how to get you in is important. Um, I think job fairs, although they're a little bit different now, I think job fairs are great. You're talking to people and you're getting your resume out there and you're really having an opportunity to find those jobs. 
USA Jobs is so hard. Um, no offense to them, but like even the resume you have to turn in on there has to be absolutely perfect because I think it goes through some kind of scan first and then they will just throw it out if it's not correct. And it is so hard to write it correctly um, because it's just so specific and how it needs to be turned in. Mm -hmm. But there actually are consultants out there that will help you get those jobs. You can pay them and they will teach you how to write those resumes and apply for those jobs. Um, sometimes you have to write your resume different for each job, which takes a lot of time. So it's very frustrating. Uh, but again, I think working with others that you know, people in the field, job, well, conferences, conferences are a great way to meet people. Just go up to people and say, this is what I do. I really want to get involved. To me, that, that networking has always been what's been the easiest way for myself anyway. No, I totally agree. And I, and Certainly when I was at Arvo and at other conferences, I've tried to emphasize that, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there is nothing wrong with going up to a booth or going up to somebody who does research, maybe at a company or at a government agency that you might be interested in and shaking their hand and saying, I want to introduce myself. I'm fascinated by what you do, yeah. what your company does, whatever, what your agency does. You know, can you tell me more? I mean, un unless they're obviously busy, someone will make the time to speak with you. There's mo for most people, there's no more favorite topic than themselves. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I mean, especially, especially if you're at a booth and I've done this for, I did this for years. A lot of times you just end up getting really bored at the booth, you know, and you can only talk to so many people about the exact same questions before you get yeah. bored. Somebody else coming up to you and saying, Hey, what do you do? Yes, let, let's talk. I'm more than happy to talk to you. Right. So don't ever be shy to do that. Yeah, and I do think like go-getters are the kind of people you want to hire. So I love when people are very like, here's my resume, here's what I do, or can I reach out to you? Um, those are the kind of people I generally think are end up being really good employees. So, Is that, so how else do you assess uh, someone being like a self-starter or a go-getter? So one, they, they come up and they introduce you, but what else do you look yeah. for? Um, I look for people that have just even a little bit of knowledge. So if they were interested in SA or the agency or whatever it is, right, they come up to me and say like, hey, I looked you guys up on the internet and I noticed you're doing X, Y, Z and, you know, here's what my degree's in and I would really like that to me is very telling that they've already taken that initiative. There are people that I interview now that haven't they know they're going to have their interview and they haven't even looked anything up. So to wow. me, it's like, well, how interested are you and how prepared are you? And what does that mean for your future employment? If, you know, you need to get on that interview with like a suit on and be ready, camera on, questions ready, um, you know, and know a little bit about what you're going to talk about. That, yeah. that tells me you're, you're hard, you know, you are organized, hardworking, and you really are interested. Even better if you've researched the person you're interviewing with as well. When people say, hey, I noticed you were, you're like, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, my One of my friends who I interviewed very, very early on, uh, Julie Tetzloff, she swears that she got her first industry job because she looked up the guy she was interviewing with. Turns out they were both from Wisconsin and she just like opened with a Brett Favre com comment and like, yes. oh, done. <laughs> The ties are great, great opportunities. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. And I, I was interviewing somebody once and I was absolutely blown away because he sits down at the table across from me. He opens up his folder, pulls out a paper that I wrote and said, wow. I have such similar research interests. I love this paper. And I was like, you're done, done. Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> this interview is over. When can you yeah, start? I had that happen, but that's great. <laughs> Yeah. That's never. That's only happened to me once, Carrie. But I was I was absolutely blown away. Like, oh that's my gosh, who does that? I I wish yeah. I had thought of doing that. It was such a good move. If you show up late, you're not dressed appropriately, you have no questions ready, and you get our name wrong, it's like hmm, oh. I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. You have to show. There, there's ways to show genuine interest, and and I think even, even over the internet, people can smell BS. You can tell if someone is just not into it, but they need a job or they need insurance or, you know, they, they think that this is going to be their foray into making more money right off the bat. You know, I, 
I tell people um, when I talk to trainees, they say, look, you have to understand your own motivations for wanting to seek a career outside academics. You know, mm-hmm. if it's just because you're so sick of doing lab work, I mean, work is going to be tedious and difficult anywhere you go. You know, if you, if, if, so if you understand that about yourself and you say, no, I'm, my skills are not being used appropriately, or I feel like I would shine better in this type of uh, environment versus this type of environment. You have to know yourself and you have to know your motivations because we'll be able to pick that up in the interview. Yeah. Agree. Agree. So, so back to you, because after, after all of this time in the government, you moved to Texas. It looks yeah. like you kind of went back to academics, right? Well, sort of. It was still a government contract. So uh, I was minding my business. I love this story. Uh, working for JPO and loved it. The people were amazing. And um, I got an email from a former boss who I'd worked for at Jarba. And they, asked, they started asking me questions. And I was like, what are these questions about? Um, and then it turned out they, had, they were asking me to come down and assist setting up It was a center for innovation and advanced developing and manufacturing. It was part state funded, so state of Texas, and part federally funded by um, BARDA. So that was um, how I ended up down there. It was amazing, but so different for us. Um, My husband and I are Northeasterners, and, you know, never did I live in Texas. I had no idea where College Station was, so... It took a lot of time to really think through it and move the whole family, but it was an amazing opportunity. And, you know, the government was setting up a facility that was really novel and very um, useful to helping medical countermeasure production in the U.S. So I really was excited to be on board with that. I like how you said that it was you know, this amazing opportunity, because again, for some people, people have different motivations, but it sounds like in this particular case for you, the motivation was being part of something from the ground up and helping to build it and adding those skills to your skill sets. Yes. And I love challenges, unfortunately, which I, you know, I make myself crazy by doing that, but like, I'll finally get into a job and I'm like, all steady state, like, all right. And then something new comes and I'm like, I got to do it. And it's like that challenge was probably the hardest thing I've done in my entire career because I had to go down to Texas and manage this huge team. And I say huge because I had a a team, but then also I had to oversee the construction and the construction team. What did I know about construction? Nothing. So I had to Earn and really trust this team to build these facilities. Um, and then there were there were just so many pieces and parts. And then there was the university and all the university um, pieces, like the attorneys and all of that we had to work with. And so there was so much happening on any given day to get these facilities ready. It was oh, amazing. Yeah. That, it's giving me a headache just thinking about it. Yeah. It was hard because my kids were little then too. So that made it a lot, a lot harder, but yeah, but it, but gonna, it was amazing. Now I was going to ask how, if I may, how, like how, how young were your children? Did they have to switch schools, make new friends, all that? Yes. So they were in kindergarten and when we moved here and hopefully they won't see the podcast, it goes, they'll get mad. We put them back in kindergarten because where we lived in Virginia was half day kindergarten and my boys needed a little more time. So it was perfect to just move them to full day kindergarten again in a new state so they could make friends from the ground up. You know what I mean? And move up because we really thought we were going to stay there. I thought that this effort would last a really long time and I would stay. So mm-hmm. that was kind of the concept. So yeah, my boys were in kindergarten at the time. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And then you went back to the DC metro area about five years later? Yeah. Um, it was more like four. I did stay with AM another year. Okay. Uh, well, I was in DC. Uh, area but my husband was in sales always was and he had to fly back to dc a lot so i was sort of doing this job that took 13 hour days and i was sort of a single parent part of the time and he was constantly traveling so we thought okay like we can do this but i wasn't sure how long the effort would last and college station is an amazing town a and amazing university i had so much fun there but 
it's like it's a small town so if there weren't jobs like there aren't jobs available like there are here so i didn't know what was going to happen and we were trying to make that decision which lots of families do before the boys got out of that middle school into that high school range what yeah. do you do next so we didn't want to move them in high school so we said okay we need to go beforehand and that's how we ended up back wow you know that's it's interesting because i think that's got to be really, really challenging. And I've talked to other people in the past, like if they have to work long days or if they have to travel a lot, for mm -hmm. them, the, the most critical thing is to be around family and friends and people who they can just say, you know, hey, I've got a long day. Can my kid, can you pick up my kids from school? And, you know, can they stay at your house for dinner until I get home or something like that? I mean, that's got to be an enormous challenge on your part to navigate yeah. all that. And that's something as women that we have to think about. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, when I initially had my boys, I was allowed to work part time, which was amazing. I was finishing up a DARPA program and it just all worked out. Okay. Um, but then when I went back to work, it was it was definitely harder. You know, as, you know, any woman in our in any field will tell you when you work, you feel like you're giving you're trying to give it all to work and you're trying to give it all to your kids. And it's just so hard. But, you know, it's a challenge I think we all struggle with. Big time. Yeah, uh, I can't speak for me. My kids have four legs, but uh, not two. But <laughs> but I I've, I've definitely spoken to an, enough women that I I understand at, at a cerebral level what that what that must feel like. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Are your boys twins? They are. Oh my gosh! Then I've heard that two babies are a lot of babies. Yes, especially when I was an only child and I had no idea what I was doing. So it was really fun. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, it seems like it's all worked out, though, and they're I not. Know, I, don't them. I don't know what their opinion is. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's all good. Yeah. But then, um, I guess in our in our last few minutes, I was just I wanted to go back to talking a little bit about um, like the interview process. So, besides, um, like if, when you're interviewing somebody who maybe is still in academia. Maybe they're finishing up their postdoc. Um, maybe they're maybe they haven't even done a postdoc yet. Like what 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 else do you look for besides you know a person's interest and clearly they're you know a self starter? What what else do you look for in terms of like a good candidate? Yeah, that's tough. I think the number one thing beyond that that you need to work at least at the agencies we work at right now. There are other agencies and the pace is different, but the pace where we are and what we talked about is very rapid um, and you also need to be an outside of the box thinker. If all you want to do or all you can do is what you've learned in school and you wanna stay on that trajectory, that's fine. But this is not that, right? So what we do really requires thinking, okay, there is a problem and it needs solved and there's a solution. How do I get to that solution? Not there isn't a solution, not right now, maybe someday, like that does not work at these yeah. agencies. It's how do I get there? And yeah. being really creative how you get there. Like it's amazing once you open that gamut up and you see proposals from companies that you're like, wow, this company you would normally think has nothing to do with this field, but this proposal makes sense. Like they yeah. can get to where we need to be. So. Yeah. It's very interesting. You have to have an open mind right from the get go. So to me, that's super important. And I, and for speaking for myself, I have to tell everybody, I think that those skills can be learned. Yeah. I, I personally, I don't have a very creative skill set. So, I mean, I, I, I joke all the time. I'm a, I'm a protocol follower. It's, it's what I was. It's what I do. I, I follow recipes. I do not make up my own recipes. They turn out. <laughs> You know, I, I was a musician for many, many years. I, I will play what's on the page. I will follow, you know, the dynamics um, and like any guidance that's being given. But I, I took a composition course and it was, I was awful. I was so bad at it, you know, right. because that's, that's just not how my brain works, you know. But there are some people that that's literally like these, these engineers that I'm speaking to lately. I mean, they, they can come up with these things, you know, well, if we can do this and we can do this, and we can do this, we can just put it together and boom, you have a new device and it blows my mind. And so I want to try to share with everybody, you know, in these few months that I've been at this very fast paced agency that is very much uh, interested in thinking outside the box, 
you can learn how to do it. You know, it's, it, it takes time. And from my personal experience, my, my 44 year old brain kicks and screams when it comes to some of it, you know, but, but, you know, you, you can find ways to gain confidence in someone's ability. You know, you don't have personally have to have that ability yourself, but if you read enough papers, you go back to what you, what you've learned, you know, go to the literature, find the key opinion leaders. You can, you can do those things and teach yourself how to think outside the yeah. box. It's possible. If you're willing to, you have to be willing, but yeah, I'm with you. I'm generally a rule follower too, but I think because my career started so early at DARPA, like I was shaped by that. And, yeah. and then from there, I've always been willing to think outside the box and I love it. I love anything that's startup like that. And that's so cool. Cause my, the, the word that I learned to absolutely despise is the word incremental. You know, and I was always told my, in my in my R01 applications, my other grant applications, you know, this is only going to lead to an incremental change in how we treat, you know, in my case, glaucoma. And I, I hated that word, but they were absolutely right. I mean, because I was playing it so safe. That's, I was only willing to step so far right. out of the box and so far out of my comfort zone. But, you know, in, mm -hmm. in talking to you, I mean, you, it seems like you live outside your comfort zone. <laughs> I do. I don't know why I do that because I really am a very like type A rule follower. I don't I don't know how I balance those two. I make myself crazy a little bit over it, but I do. I really always like that challenge. And, um, you know, the the program managers we bring into these agencies are amazing with the technologies they come up with. And I mean, if you don't push the envelope, how will we ever really address the things we need to address, right? Like who would have thought CRISPR technology was ever gonna happen? That's unbelievable, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Really. And now people just do it, you know? You, yeah. I, I was just at this conference recently and I said to somebody once, because they were asking me, you know, do you, do you, do you miss it? And I said, honestly, I think that if I tried to come back, I would be so far behind because everyone's using CRISPR. Everyone's yeah. using, you know, viral vectors and um, even technology beyond, you know, that sort of thing. They're using micro, like, like lab on a chip now, microfluidics. And I would be so far behind just, you know, culturing my cells and doing PCR reactions. I mean, nobody would fund anything that I did anymore. <laughs> I love science. I love talking science. I love science podcasts. Like anything like this is interesting to me. My kids are just like, oh my God, please stop talking about this at dinner. Okay. Are your and kids on board in this house? So, <laughs> so then your kids going to grow up to be uh, artists or something? Just, you I know, know, right? I don't no, know. No science, mom. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Well, uh, Carrie, thank you so much for your time. I mean, is, are there any closing words that you have for our listeners or if there's any how can people find you if they want to learn more yeah um i just say like whatever you want to do do it and if you go the wrong direction like that isn't wrong because our path isn't necessarily known we just do what we do and we you know sometimes like the picture shows up later as to why things went the way they went because when i look back in my career i'm amazed at like it all really did work out and it all, each thing led to the next, right? So, you know, give yourself time and grace and um, trust in the process and just think about what you want to do next and whatever it is, you can do it. But um, sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it's not going to happen right away and you're going to have to work hard. Um, True. Yeah, um, I can be reached at kdemarco, D-E-M-A-R-C-O at S-A-I-N-C.com. I'm on LinkedIn like everybody else. Um, so yeah, pretty much anywhere or through you. Uh, yes. reach me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, this, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for the, the, the discussion on, on grit and challenges and what about that podcast or what Ted talk. It was a Ted talk. The Ted talk. Yes. The, the, the awesome. I, I, I'm going to find that Ted talk and I'll put a link in, in the show notes because yes. I have to go check it out myself. That sounds amazing. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Carrie, for your time. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you. It's great talking to you. I want to thank Dr. Carrie DeMarco for joining us today. And I will put a link in the show notes for that TED talk that she talked about. So, see you next time.